by Dr. Gustavo Shinneman, Associate Professor, Extension Veterinarian, The Ohio State University. My name is Eric Pulaski. I am the Sustainable Agriculture Educator with the Ohio Ecological Food and Farm Association. I will moderate this afternoon's presentation. This event is part of a series of educational programs provided by OFA, the Ohio State University Veterinarian Extension to practicing veterinarians, farmers, and animal health professionals who work with certified organic livestock. Partial funding for this webinar is provided through a grant from the North Central Region Sustainable Agriculture Research and Education Program. And CRSAIR has awarded more than $40 million worth of competitive grants to farmers, ranchers, researchers, educators, public and private institutions, nonprofit groups, and others exploring sustainable agriculture in 12 states. We thank SAIR for this support. The questions this afternoon will be by group discussion with open mics for all. We will have time for questions at the end of the presentation. The presenter will address them during the designated question period at the end. OFA is pleased and fortunate to introduce Dr. Shinneman as our presenter. He has direct experience in clinical production and research aspects of the dairy industry, and we hope that this presentation can enhance the triple bottom line of your organic dairy operation. So without further ado, Dr. Shuman. Okay, now um, I hope you can hear me, and I thanks uh, for the introduction. And um, so I'm going to just uh, go over these uh, topics on, on uterine diseases, and um, I try to cover a few things uh, uh, regarding the most common uh, uterine diseases, and uh, we will go through a very brief description of what they are, and um, and uh, and why they may or may not be a problem. And, and at the end, we will talk about some treatment strategies as well as uh, we will go over some of the uh, uh, management practices uh, to prevent uh, these diseases in the first place. So before I uh, go on, I, I have a two, three slides here that I think are important uh, to understand why uterine diseases are, are important. So I guess in, the, in, in any business, uh, uh, the daily operation, the uh, conventional or organic, uh, what are those three largest expenses of the business? So feeding lactate in cows is perhaps uh, at the top of the list, then uh, raising uh, replacement heifers and labor, right? Uh, and labor is a combination, even though it's in the third place, it does have indirect implication with, you know, both of the feeding lactating cows and, and raising uh, replacement heifers. So what we do with this once the cow goes through labor and initial lactation, so feeding those cows, uh, uh, it really matters because it affects the bottom line of the any operations. So when you go to replacement heifers, you know, and you try to answer the question, what is the largest expense of a heifer raising operation? And, and usually the answer is P. So how do we get, you know, after the calving and do once we have this uh, female uh, calf, um, and we want to raise that calf to pregnant uh, uh, heifers. So feed is, is one of the top expenses in, 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 in from all the way. And it usually takes about 24, 25 months uh, of age. So now, what determines based on feed? And usually it's age at calving, right? Which is determined by, by nutrition management, you know, from birth uh, to breeding, uh, growth, especially the first two months of life, matter that dictates the performance of the cow uh, uh, after a, a parturition, the first lactation, and, uh, and subsequent lactation uh, and development. Conception is very important. So as you can see, 
from lactating cows to raising heifers and, and calving. So calving is an important component. And, uh, and the placement heifers, it does determine uh, uh, based on feed, and we know that based on feed are made expensive. So I'm going to talk from now on, once we have these uh, cows uh, 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 on labor, you know, that is perhaps uh, from the cow point of view, is, you know, this is a risk factor for them to develop how we manage cows prior to calving. And, and a right early lactation will determine whether or not they develop uterine disease. Right? So before I jump on uterine disease, I just want to define what these conditions uh, are. So you have a cow at calving, the first uh, 24 hours, uh, you know, the cow usually you know, go through delivery, you have a calf on the ground, the next step for the cow is to release the fetal membrane. So the fetal membrane is very important because uh, uh, we always look in, usually cows are going to release the membrane between 8 to 12 hours, and any fetal membrane that is retained more than 24 hours, we will call that is the cow that has retained fetal membrane. So 24 hours after parturition, that became a, a, a problem for the cow, and for some reason, you know, uh, the cow uh, retained those uh, elements. So from day one to 21, uh, any uterine discharge, vaginal discharge coming from the uterus, we will call that a, a cow with a, a metride. So and I'm going to explain a little bit more in detail what a metride is, and it has a little bit of combination and, um, you know, okay, you can have uterine discharge, but the cow may not have, you know, may, it is not yet sick of what we call the cow with fever, and she's off feed, so she's, she's not feed. And uh, so we know in general any uterine discharge is bad for the cow. That's delay conception, and, uh, and it's a risk factor for calling it the farm. But there are different grades different uh, severities of metritis, and I'll go more and more in this case. And um, any uterine disease, any, any uterine discharge, you know, it is from day 21 to 40, we call that clinical endometritis. And uh, this is just a full length of bloody discharge and um, that is coming out of the uterus. So as you can see, when cow progress from uh, lactation right after calving, each one of the disease has a particular time component. And this is very important because of record keeping, right? So when we talk and compare farm to farm, that became crucial. So we talk about the same uh, conditions. And from day 40 to 60 days in milk, when I, when I say, you know, after calving, it's just days in milk. That's what we call subclinical endometrite. Right? So this is the classic cow that they do have an inflammation and, uh, inside the uterus, but you don't see any clinical sign like the vaginal discharge. So you see inflammation there, yes, that prevents maternal recognition, the embryo is inside the uterus, but there is no maternal recognition, so cow cycle is normal. And on top of that, I just, depending on the farm, some farmers start breeding cows on 45 days, some other farmers start breeding cows later. So, but how this uterine condition, you know, the prevalence of this uterine condition will determine how cows perform, especially how cows, whether or not they became pregnant. Why do we need cows pregnant? So, the, 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 you know, there are, it, it, it's a two, uh, two-fold uh, uh, reason there. One is because you need a replacement, and especially you need to know those uh, heifers, and then you need to initiate lactation. So this is basically how uh, daily operations make money. So anyway, I think this is perhaps the most important, uh, just to define uterine diseases, and each one of them has a time component. I will emphasize most of my presentation around metritis, and, uh, and also I'll talk about retained fetal membrane, especially if they do retain after, you know, after 24 hours. You know, some of those cows may 
be a risk factor to develop nephritis. And some of cows, when they do develop, you know, the intrauterine condition, nephritis, and that is a risk factor to develop, you know, subsequent disease and so on. As time goes by, usually cows start, you know, cleaning the uterus, and hopefully we reach our breeding system. When we reach a breeding system with a clean uterine environment, and when we start breeding those cows, you know, they do become pregnant. So why uterine disease is this important? I guess it's uh, it depending on the severity of the uterine conditions, like, you know, a thousand in this uh, picture is showing, you know, some vaginal discharge like, coming out of the uterus, you know, a few days after, uh, after cabin. So if they do have severe metritis, so the cow is sick and she's not eating or drinking, so the first consequence we have a used milk yolk. And, uh, and in particular, you know this cow has a particular smell, so it's a pink discharge and uh, characteristic of uh, nephritis. And, and, and the reduced milk yolk, it, it, it could be associated with pain. I mean, usually, cows in pain do not eat. And uh, they do have uh, both reduced uh, conception, so it takes longer for them to become pregnant. And, um, and increase base open. So the cows, you know, take several uh, attempts to, for them to become uh, pregnant. Uh, and, and in some cases, if they don't become pregnant, usually at the end of lactation, since they are not pregnant, it's an increase, you know, it's a big factor to be, called, you know, for those cows to be removed from the farm. So early, uh, uh, it's a risk of cold. And, um, and as you can see there, and the graph below, this is the proportion of cows not pregnant. And, um, and here on and, and, and the X axis, you know, they, these are the basic milk from calving all the way up to 380 milk. And, and we know that uh, uterine diseases, you know, the solid line, these are cows that never get sick. So these are normal, healthy cows. Well, right after the voluntary wedding period, which is about 45 days, so they start breeding cows and then they start becoming pregnant. And at the end of the uh, uh, lactation, and usually cows, if you look, you know, on average, uh, uh, they might be about 300 and, and, and five days in milk. You can see still a few cows are not pregnant. They're very, very few. These two group of cows we will see later on. And uh, this is an experiment we did in an organic farm, uh, developing a, a treatment option for um, for cows that develop a clinical endometritis. Right? As you can see, either one of the two cows, either cows that have no treatment, this big dash uh, line versus this one, the cows that receive a, a, a treatment, they still. Are, you know, cows that are treated has better conception, but still they are far from how normal healthy cows that do not have a uterine problems, you know, they, they take longer. And at the end of this lactation, you still have about 18 to 20 percent of the cows that are not pregnant. And usually these are the cows that perhaps at the end of lactation, they are just, you know, exit uh, the farm. So, and as you know, calling cows do have a, a cost for producers. And uh, so you need to replace that cow for a new pregnant heritage. So this is livestock healthcare practices standard, and this is just on the National Organic uh, Program. And I uh, just want to set up the stage uh, before I go over the treatment. So uh, the livestock healthcare practice standard says that producer must establish and maintain preventive livestock health practice. And then there are some provisions uh, of uh, condition will allow exercise, freedom of movement, reduction of the stress uh, appropriate to species, perform of physical alteration as needed to promote the animal welfare and any skin matter that minimize pain and stress. I think we don't know much about 
whether or not this is a painful event. And I'll show you some data that I think it, you know, especially those cars that have severe nephritis, and, and I might explain why dry matter intake drop early lactation and they develop uh, uh, nephritis. And it might be associated with chest pain, right? And uh, another important is that produced must not administer anything, you know, that violate the FDA uh, uh, regulation. Uh, and here I think it is important because on one hand, we want to keep the car in the operation system, right? And then we, we, we don't want the cows to exit the farm. And, uh, but it is clear in the standard that we cannot withhold medical treatment from a sick animal in an effort to preserve its organic status. Basically, if we use, for example, antibiotics, this is a farm that uh, we have to keep record of that individual animal, identify the animal, and if we do have to treat these animals because they develop these severe cases of metritis, this is one of you know the animal must exit uh, the farm. It loses the, the organic status and it must exit the, uh, the farm. So. I just go through uh, this one. There is a number of allowed products under the National Organic Program. There is a list. You can use the things, iodine, space, uh, C aspirin, and fluoxetine. I think it is it's very important and, uh, and uh, for pain management. And, um, and I, I think it is important for these severe cases. This is a very few cows that are going to develop these severe cases. But it is important that uh, in our protocol to use some of the uh, pain management. I just leave it there. There is a, a few others uh, for other conditions uh, uh, approved. And uh, but here is a, a, a short list of that. So right at the time of Calvin, you know, I'm going to just explain now some of the normal physiological things that a cow has to go through right after, you know, at it has from Calvin all the way uh, to pregnancy, right? So at the time of Calvin, and you can see there, so this is a, a classic cow that is in labor, right? You can see one of the feet of the cow. So the cow, you're going to see manure there. You're going to see manure. So if the cow stand up, you know, and the feet get into the uterus, you're going to start feeding the uterus with E. coli. So this is perhaps a normal process for the cow, and if the immune system is strong enough, it's going to clean the uterus and the cow will not show any uh, clinical signs or any vaginal discharge, uh, um, or, or she will not get uh, sick. But it is important to understand that this is you know, a normal process for the cow. All cows go through a similar process. And, uh, and and we are going to have it. it's an open you know the uterus became open and it became contaminated. So how we manage cows right before Calvin and right after Calvin, especially how you know anything associated uh, with dry matter intake, especially if the, if the dry matter intake drop, it, it, it might be one of the big risk factors for the cows to develop the. the so the first one, as I mentioned before, is retention of fetal membrane, and it's defined as the failure to expel the membrane, you know, 24 hours after birth. And usually we keep track of the time, and then we just see there, as the picture shows, you know, the membranes are still hanging out of the, the out of the, the, the vagina. So there is a number of risk factors for those: abortion, stillbirth, cows that experience severe, you know, heavy social, uh, heat stress, uh, uterine torsion, and hypocalcemia. I'll talk about a little bit at the end of the presentation about hypocalcemia, because sometimes it's, this is, uh, um, it could be one of our, our, our treatment uh, for the pain fetal membrane. So just if the cows are, you know, initiating lactation, and when cows initiate lactation, basically they need a set amount of calcium that goes to milk. So if you milk cows twice a day, so the cow is going to lose, you know, this many grams of calcium. So she cow has to eat to compensate that calcium loss that goes to milk. Right. So here is the definition for postpartum metritis. It's an inflammation of all layers of the uterus with 
systemic sign of illness. So the cow, you know, would have fever, she would be uh, all feed, and, uh, and perhaps the pain here is difficult to measure pain, and I think I do have one slide that I'll probably show you later. Uh, and, and, and a way to measure uh, pain, in my, uh, uh, we use the activity monitor. So, and uh, we can compare a cow from the same farm how much, uh, how many steps, or what is their activity as they uh, are coming out of the uh, partition. Right, and you can see big differences in cows that has the uh, uh, postpartum nephritis and, and normal cows. And, and, and that, you know, the consequence is they do walk less and if they do have pain and, and develop fever, you know, you're going to have a drop in new production. And new production is the consequence either because they are not drinking water and, and time by the day also goes down. So the clinical signs, these are the perhaps, you know, those severe cases are very easy to tell. It's the cold smelling, you know, brown, red, water vaginal discharge within the first uh, 21 days in milk. And especially cows will start having these clinical signs on day six, right, day five, six, seven, and, uh, and even some of the cows might be on day 11 or 14 uh, after fertilization. So the incident range, you know, depending on the farm and depending also the variation during the season, whether we are in the winter or we are in the summer, you know, from 6% to 35% uh, of the cows. So very briefly, after partition, cows are going to have discharge. We just need to recognize what is normal versus what is the problem for the cow. So this is a normal vaginal discharge. So this is a cow that has about two days. You know, recovering from partition, you see the cows are laying down, and you see that you know vaginal discharge, and uh, this is is not a problem. This is just you know cleaning the uterus and the uterine involution process. And uh, here is another one, and then usually you see this one with when cows are you know right after milking they go to the feed bank, they eat, and uh, you see this in a, even in a confinement system or perhaps in, in, in grazing as well. So once the cow is full and she ate, she probably laid down, and you can see some of these uh, these charges. So this is okay. I mean, you're, you're going to see for a few days uh, after partition these, you know, vaginal uh, discharges. So here is a cow that, are, you know, uh, still has this uh, uh, vaginal discharge, but the, you, you need to keep an eye on this cow. So this is a cow that has, you know, the, really bloody discharge, and then you can start seeing here some of the, you know, pus or, or mucopollen discharge. So this is a cow that we perhaps need to keep an eye on, look at the weather, how they feel, and uh, do they have any dehydration, uh, or they are off, they are, uh, off feed. And, um, and sometimes the discharge might be like this, but there is no smell there, and the cow do not have any fever, and she acts normal. So that might be the cow coping with the infection, and she probably get over this without major problem. But from here on, it might be just 24 hours later, and then you can start seeing that the beast it get really watery, right? It's like a diarrhea coming from the urine. So the cow is going to start losing a lot of water, and it's, uh, it's sometimes it's the classic E. coli uh, infection. They come from the year. So these are the cows that we need just to keep an eye at how they progress and how they they are coming out of this uterine involution. So these are cows that are about 20 days, 20 to 30 days in milk. And still, you can see there. There, uh, this is the cows that probably don't have any any uh, any any other than the a little bit of pass in the in the discharge. The cow are not sick. She's acting normally. She's drinking. She is walking, uh, and um, it's just that the, the uterus and it has a little bit of the inflammation. You can see by the a little bit of the vaginal discharge and pass. If we are start breeding these cows, so these are early cows, and this probably is before 30 days in milk. So these need to be cleaned 
if we are using 45 day as our voluntary wearing period. This is the cow that a classic cow that perhaps we breed this cow uh, and she gets, you know, the, the sperm goes to the oviduct, fertilize the eggs. By the time the embryo comes in the urine, if there is this uh, uh, inflammation in the urine, probably the process of maternal recognition is not going to happen and the cow is going to cycle normally. So actually, if we do have the embryo, everything is uh, is good to go. But just because of uterine environment problem, because of that little inflammation in the uterus, and uh, so we don't have the process of maternal recognition and the cow cycle again. So here is another cow. It has normal uh, vaginal discharge. Just a few days after calving, uh, uh, and, uh, and this is uh, uh, normal for cows. And uh, here is the cow that is about uh, uh, 28 days in milk. And this is, you know, like I mentioned before, if you remember, the first 20 days is the uh, metritis. Between 21 and 40 is clinical endometritis. So this is the classic cow that has a clinical endometritis. Uh, and you can see there, there is a large amount of fluid coming out of the vagina. And then usually, uh, at, at clinical uh, examination, this is the cow that has one of the uterine cones, you know, where the calf was uh, located before. That you can see that that horn has a lot of fluid inside. So when the cow are full and she lays down, you probably see something. We will talk about the treatment uh, in, in a few minutes now for this cow. And again, this is the cow that has a uh, clinical endometritis. It's just full-length vaginal discharge. There is no blood there. So here are the general treatment principles uh, for this. And then the prevention is the top. You know, it should be at the top of the list, especially monitoring those risk factors. And I'm going to talk about these risk factors in a few minutes now. So what we do for these uh, uh, clinical cases, so specifically those severe cases, and um, for those cows that develop nephritis, those cows have severe vaginal discharge, they have fever, the cows is uh, off feed, and, and milk production really drops. So controlling bacterial infection is, is the number one, and uh, you gotta reduce elevated body temperature and, uh, and, and pain management. For these two, we have uh, the national uh, Organic program allow the use of uh, uh, banamine and, uh, and, and aspirin. And, uh, and also, you need to restore dry matter intake as quick as possible. And that, you know, the dry matter intake is basically for really explain why cows, when they are sick, you know, need to action drop uh, very sharply. So, here is the decision tree. And, uh, and I'm going to talk about this is what perhaps we use in, in conventional farms. So there is individual cows for examination and diagnosis, right? So anything on the green box is our diagnosis that we are going to do on the farm. It is important that for, for those producers to establish a protocol. So how you are going to watch cows after partition, how many days you're going to watch, and what are those uh, clinical signs that you're going to monitor, right? Because once the cow became sick, you are in the decision, so it's the red box, right? And, um, and, and here are, you know, very, you know, very few cows should come to the decision point where you see some of these, you know, a severe Metritis that you perhaps even in organic you, 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 you will need to do some antibiotic treatment. So let me just walk you through for the diagnosis. Usually you're going to look for two major things, right? You're going to look for the vaginal discharge and you are going to use a thermometer just to monitor the rectal temperature, right? And then you're going to do all the behavior of the cow. You're going to look the activity. You know, usually healthy cows socialize and they walk. And uh, whether or not they eat, that is important because that determines, uh, 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 it's associated uh, oftentimes with temperature, specifically fever or, or pain. 
And, and if the cow has those, say, water in discharge, especially with E. coli bacteria, they are going to lose a lot of fluid by, by the urine. So the cow will do have some sort of dehydration. And then it's a combination of factors. The cow is softy, she's not drinking. Also, if you keep milking them, so she will become very quick in, in, a, in a day or two dehydrated, right? So if the cow do not have foul smelling and she's acting normally and, and do not have fear problems, so this is just a recheck cow, so she's doing okay. So some of cows do have foul smelling vaginal discharge, like I mentioned in, in our uh, definition of the disease, but still they do not have fear. She's acting normally, she's eating and she's producing the production is okay, walking and acting with other cows. So this is, we know that any rational discharge is bad for reproduction, but it's still she's not developing the clinical, you know, she, she's still not sick. She's eating, she's not dehydrated, and she has only the, the rational discharge sign. Right, so if this is a rechecked out, that was the following day or the other day, and um, but if the cow, after the recheck, she can positive for the cold smelling vaginal discharge, and she's positive for fever, right? And she's off feed and dehydrated, this is kind of a severe case. So these are the classic severe cases, and you're going to see a drop in production, right? Then these are perhaps our candidates for a treatment, right? And this is what you establish with your veterinarian a treatment for uh, uh, necrosis. I'm going to mention now a little bit about this group of cows that perhaps are, are a, a number of them, right? Um, that is still, they are not sick, they are acting normally, they are eating, they are walking, and they are not dehydrated, but they do have full smelling vaginal discharge. And we know from the reproduction point of view that is still, even though we don't use antibiotics for these cows, they, it takes longer for them to become pregnant. Right? So there is a recent study that just was established using an intrauterine infusion of an organic 35 product. And that product is used to flash. Right? So what they found in this study, they involved just severe cases of uh, uh, metritis, right? And those cows that were treated with this intrauterine infusion had higher odds of conceiving, so of conceiving, they, 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 they became pregnant earlier uh, and improved reproductive performance, right? So they were able to recover from the infection and improve reproductive performance. Um, and they compared those, uh, the use of this uh, utero flash uh, um, infusion with uh, cows that were treated with iodine solution. So Either one of the two, it seems that uh, utero flash uh, uh, improves clinical recovery as well as reproductive performance. This is, uh, I think we are going to see more and more information on this. And, um, and again, this is the, um, uh, it, it is not an FDA approved, and I think that they mentioned in, in the paper, it's not an FDA approved uh, uh, product. But it's uh, definitely uh, an organic certified uh, uh, drug that they, they use and test for these cows that develop uh, uh, toxic uh, metrology. And those, those are kind of a severe cases. So here is some of our data regarding cows that experience uh, this social calving. They do have greater risk uh, for metrology. And, and you can see there, these are just two examples of cows from the same farm, right? We place uh, an activity device, it's like a thermometer that measures the number of steps and uh, represented as the motion index here. This is just the activity, daily activity that the cow they have as, you know, they go by after calving. And you can see, you know, here is an assisted cow to develop a right? And each one of these arrow is showing you their milking time, right? So three eggs, three milking time, and um, a day for this particular farm. So 
Moscow went through the delivery, right? And you can see that the car will be so once they enter the mission parlor, so they go, you know, walk in the pasture and come back. They just only walk, they don't socialize much between meals. They just, you know, we, we walk them to the parlor, they come out of the parlor and they stay quiet. So they don't go anywhere. And this might be why cows that experience dystocia and that they have greater risk for metritis because it's associated with pain, they don't eat, they don't walk. And, um, and they don't drink. So versus cows that have normal delivery, that they even, you know, between milking, they do socialize and they do walk up and down. So here is, I think these are our candidate cows that might benefit from pain management, specifically for those cows that develop uh, uh, this social cow. So this is one of our studies that uh, uh, we did uh, uh, work on, and this is an organic farms and uh, we were testing intrauterine dextrose and uh, we used uh, 200 cc of 50% dextrose as an infusion and, uh, and cows, we checked cows on day 26 plus minus 3. So cows that were between uh, 23 to 29 days in milk and um, so we know that uterine health status you know, whether or not they have vaginal discharge on 26 days in milk, they, they, they are significant associated with ovarian structure. So uterine infection, it does have a negative impact on the ovary, just, just on the ovary, right? And, and what we look is the prevalence of the tears, corpus luteum. And uh, this is important because we need this one to be able for cows to begin training. And, um, and also, this is important because this uh, structure is the one to use progesterone. So progesterone concentration at day 26 or day 40 is immediately associated with pregnancy. So very simple. After calving, cow has to do walk through the uterine involution process as quick as possible and recover dry matter intake. By day 26, they have to have clean uterine uh, uh, environment, so very few cows with vaginal or uterine discharge. If we accomplish this, they usually do not have any problem in getting pregnant. So they will produce milk and they will become pregnant uh, right after the going by the way. So in this experiment, what we did is we used this intrauterine infusion of just 200 cc. Those cows that were positive for clinical endometritis, we infused, and usually you're going to have, you know, the urine has two horns, right? The, uh, the horn that uh, has the infection is usually bigger. It's where the calf used to be when the cow was pregnant. So we just infused to the larger the uterine horn 200 cc of dextrose. We recheck cows 14 days later and then we assess all reproductive performance and uh, including pregnancy losses. We follow these cows for about 300 days. So what we observe there is that uh, uh, cows, uh, here is the data. So cows, here is our control cows. Control cows didn't receive anything. They just walk uh, normally. Our dextro cows, remember these are 200 cc of 50% dextro, and uh, they do have better fertility. So they improve fertility, right? And um, between cows that are uh, non treatment versus cows that have received the dextro. And here is the cows, the normal cows. So normal cows usually have higher uh, fertility, so these are the cows that get pregnant. Uh, right away after going to the period. And you can see the survival analysis showing very uh, similar information. So uh, um, here is all open cows, you know, at the beginning of the breeding season, once we start uh, passing the voluntary wedding period for these particular farms, were 45 days. So 45 days, these are the normal cows, they became pregnant very quick. So it takes about 120 days. 110 days to get 50% of the pregnant uh, cows. 
but if you look at you know 50 percent of the pregnant cow for either you know our control or our dextrose depending on the line it takes about 150 days so it takes about 40 50 days longer for them to become pregnant and, uh, and again it seems to be uh, uh, effective for these type of cows uh, under our organic management so now I'm going to switch gears and I'm going to talk about a little bit more on, on prevention. So what are those basic physiological functions uh, to avoid transition cow diseases? And I think one of the most important is resting time. And uh, so how many hours cows are laying down after parturition, right? Because that is directly associated with dry matter intake, right? Dry matter intake and adaptation of the rumen to a new lactation diet, oftentimes they eat something different prior to covering of what they eat once they are in the uh, lactating group of cows. And uh, one of the key parameters there is ketosis. And, I, and I'll show you data. I think this is important to monitor in organic cows because this is going to tell us, you know, the energy balance of the cows. I, I really, they need to eat a diet that is dense enough that provide enough energy for the cow. If we don't meet those requirements of the cow's uh, energy uh, uh, requirement, the cow is going to lose weight. And if the cow are losing weight, you are going to see, because there is a test to monitor these cows, and you are going to see the prevalence of ketosis are going up. So we need to maintain normal calcinia. So this is just a, a very fine balance on, on how we manage cows pre-parking and how they do perform uh, right after calcium, right? If we control all these, then we can maintain a strong immune system, right? Ketosis, uh, calcium level, and resting time, all these will make up, you know, our strong immune system. If we do have a strong immune system, that will Determine uh, to a great extent the prevalence of both metabolic and infectious diseases. So, at Calvin, it is important it is just a, as a reminder you know, 20 pounds of calostrum in any cows is going to, you know, especially multiple cows. And, um, and here is an example of only 20 pounds of calostrum. You know, these cows is going to need about 20, 23 grams of calcium, right? Some cows produce 50 pounds, right, or 60 in the first 24 hours. Calostrum and milk. It's just a measure of the challenge. The cow needs a lot of calcium, and usually she mobilizes calcium from the bone to start providing, you know, uh, the other. And uh, this is what we call the calcium uh, loss in milk. So there is a set amount of calcium that is going to be lost every time we milk the uh, cow. So, and that calcium loss, and in particular for calostrum, because it, it's higher than what you have in milk, it's about 10 to 15 times higher of what you have in blood. So, a big mature cow, 15, 1500 pound cow, so it's going to have 4 to 5 grams of calcium in blood, and she needs about 23 uh, or, or more uh, a gram of calcium in, in milk. So, dry matter intake and balancing our ration, it really became a priority because that to some extent will determine whether or not they develop these uterine diseases. And remember that calcium is associated with the immune system and uh, and it also determines the, the, you know, if the immune cells need to get out of the bloodstream and get inside the uterus to be able to fight the infection. So we know that the best predictor uh, NIFAS are just is a uh, non esterified fatty acid, and DHEA is what we use as a marker for, uh, to monitor ketosis. So, the best predictor for these NIFAS and DHEA, which are negative energy balance, was calcium status after calcium. So, if a cow has hypocalcemia 24 hours after calcium, usually that the cow also is a negative energy balance. So the energy and calcium balance, these both together affect the neutrophil function. I affect the neutrophil function, and a few days later, 
you know, after parturition, you see they start the clinical signs. So a few days later, the cow is telling you that uh, something is not working properly. Uh, here is a, a calcium, this is just informative about calcium balance in cows, and it's important. And um, the way that you look here is the calcium concentration. There are different units. This is a millimolar, and but also there are always uh, just milligram by deciliter. So there is online calculator to transform this unit in a milligram by deciliter, right? And here are lactation numbers. So. Per, per lactation, second, third, fourth, fifth, seventh, sixth, and, uh, and third lactation. Basically, what you see, this is normal cows. So that this gray, uh, dark gray, is just normal cows. Here are the subclinical cows. These are the cows that are acting normally, but they do have an, a, a low level of calcium. So those are the subclinical cows. And these are the clinical, the yeast species. These are the cows that are downer cows. These are the classic cows that are no walking, they can no get up, so those are the hybrids that you see there. In, in general, every one cow that we have, each one of the dots represents a cow, right? So this is a style of almost 1,500 cows. And uh, for every cow that you have with new fever on the farm, you're going to have about 20, 25 more that are subpoena. This is our problem because these cows are acting normal, but they do have an immune compromised system. So these are very likely they develop uterine problems. Sometimes no severe problems, but they do have uterine discharge that prevent them from becoming pregnant. And as the cow age, as they get you know second, third lactation, they do produce more milk and they lose more calcium. So their calcium balance became more challenged, and they became, you know, higher prevalence of hypocalcemia, as you can see here. So dry matter intake, this is normal for cows, so during transition cows. So when, when I refer to transition cows, I'm referring to cows that are late pregnancy, they go through parturition, and they initiate lactation. That is what I mean by transition cows. You know, there is a few days prior to calving, by a few days prior to calving, the cow, the cows are going to drop, you know, have a drop, a little bit drop in dry matter intake, and then it takes about two weeks for cows to recover dry matter intake. Right? How they do this process is very important because immediately after calving, we start milking them, right, twice a day, and the cow to compensate. So the time that we milk a cow, the cow has to come up with this num you know, amount of protein, energy, and everything to be able to produce milk. So the cow, in under normal condition, they have a compromised dry matter intake, as this graph uh, uh, shows. But also, we need to provide enough energy and protein for them to be able to produce milk. So this is the most critical period on how we manage these cows. And this is what determines the immune system uh, uh, to some extent of these uh, uh, cows. So same graph, but I'm looking at a different uh, way. So here is uh, Calvin, right? And the red line is showing body condition. And uh, cows, after Calvin, I start, start losing body condition. A little bit of you know what we call the negative energy balance in these cows. And usually why we do have this uh, negative energy balance in cows. You know, dry matter intake goes down a little bit and it takes a few days to go back up, but milk goes up very sharp. Right? The cow, a few days after calving, milk starts going, going, going up. To compensate for this increase in production, the cow would have to start using their own body fat storage to compensate for the energy that she perhaps is not getting in, in our dry matter intake. So this is a very transient, and after the cow, you know, recover dry matter intake, the cow starts putting more weight, and at the end of lactation, we have a cow that has recovered uh, dry matter. So as I, 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 I share with you, resting time is important. Avoid dropping dry matter intake, it is very important and ketosis and hypocalcemia. Ketosis is very important here, and, and, and I think we should monitor 
especially on day 7 and on day 14, just to see how our cows are doing and how we, or whether or not we need to adjust our diet, especially are we meeting the energy requirement of these cows. And, um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about water quality, especially on our pre-fresh cows, right? And um, because the water quality, depending on how is the, the quality, we may prone the cows to develop uterine disease. So, as I mentioned, the negative energy balance, the net, uh, uh, pre-fresh and early lactation, it, it does have a direct effect on reproduction. So this is just a confining system, but it also does apply for our uh, uh, lactating cows and the grazing management. Right. Early on in lactation, and uh, depending on how we formulate this diet and, and, and how uh, dry matter intake is, the cow may mobilize fat, which has to compensate for the energy demand to be able to produce milk. Right? And when cow mobilize fat, we measure something that is called NIFA. Right? And if the cow is still in negative energy balance, right, and, 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 uh, and the cow cannot compensate, we also can measure the HPA. And uh, that I will dictate, you know, uh, um, what we call the ketosis in, in, in cow. So I think this is important. This is an uh, indicator of energy status and every lactation, the first two weeks of lactation, just to see how our management and our diet whether or not they are meeting the energy requirement of our, our cows. Here are some parameters and reference values for that, and especially for BHVA, these are the ketosis. So cows that have more than uh, 1.2 millimoles a liter, right, and especially milking cows that are between 7 to 14 days in milk, you know, this is, you know, if, if they have higher than this, they very likely are at risk of ketosis, clinical or subclinical, displaceable mass on metrides and retain placenta. Right? So this, this is, I think it is important to monitor this and, and because it will tell us whether our diet is meeting the nutritional requirement as far as energy goes of our early lactation uh, like cows. I'll talk about a uh, uh, DCAT and uh, dietary cation anion uh, difference. I think this is important. We don't have uh, an anionic salt. I don't think we have one for for organic. And uh, but this is a strategy that is being used in, in conventional farm. So, but anyway, I just explain very briefly the concept, right? So the DCAT, what is the DCAR is the dietary cation annual difference. It's been done, it's an equation that is between the positive, you know, uh, um, uh, cation, the uh, sodium and potassium, and the negative, the anions, right, the chloride and sulfur, right? So I want my pre fresh, ideally, I want my pre fresh cows to be negative, right, to be able to control why we do this. We do this to prevent hypocalcemia. And then, as I mentioned before, hypocalcemia is associated with the immune system, right? It's something that uh, is a risk factor for them to either retain placenta or develop uterine and disease specific metrides. And I want my cows, my fresh cow, after calving to be positive, right? How much I'm feeding of these four elements, it will determine this balance, right? And in general, cows, they are going to eat, you know, this is just dry matter, how much they eat, but also there is some uh, contribution from the water. So these uh, elements are available in water. So how much the cow drinks plus how much the cow eats, we make up this balance. Right? So here is an example. This is a real example from a farm, a cation annual balance with same water. So you're going to have usually the same water uh, quality for all cows, dry cows and fresh cows, and two different diets. You, you, and, and, and a number of farms, they're going to have one diet for dry cows and a different diet for fresh cows. You can see there that our water contribution, right, of sodium, potassium, uh, sulfate, 
and chloride is the same. So here is the same. It's the same water for these two cows. But the diet has to be different. These are prepared dry matter. So a different contribution. It, uh, it's a little bit different. So what I do is for my balance, if I balance, you know, with this water quality, especially sulfate that is extremely high, these are ppm or milligrams by liter, right? It, it's extremely high the sulfate, so the negative charges, and you can you can tell by the decal balance it's minus 53, so it's really negative. I want the cows to be negative, but I don't want them to be that much negative because it creates a metabolic acidosis. So usually the cow may refuse to eat, right? So what happens with these cows, they approach partition and they are losing weight. You don't want your cows to be losing weight. That is a risk factor for retained placenta and it's a risk factor for metabolic problems, especially in the bite, right? But also I move to my fresh cow diet and I want them to be positive here. So the diet has to be positive in my goal, but still even adjusting my diet because of high concentration of sulfate, I'm not able to make it the diet a little bit positive. So it is important, I think the message that I'm trying to uh, uh, leave here is how important it is to monitor our water quality, at least once a year to sample our water quality from this uh, cow. What are the potential problems? You know, it will increase the calcium loss in pre-fresh uh, uh, cows. You know, when cows are very, very negative, you're going to see that the cows are going to lose calcium and, and urine, right? It's going to drop dry matter intake, and sometimes this drop in dry matter intake might be associated with metabolic acidosis and uh, increase the negative energy balance, so cows are approaching the partition, losing weight. This is particularly bad for heifers, and a heifer really suffers if they are losing body weight prior to calving, they will have many problems uh, when they initiate lactation. Uh, increase the prevalence of ketosis, especially the negative energy balance, so they got more ketosis and more disease, particular metride. So, I mean, we know that we have this nephritis, we are going to have poor reproductive performance. And depending on the severity of the case, we also may have a compromise in your production. So, cows, because of pain, because of off-feed, they will not produce as much as they are. So, prevention is key to control calving-related losses and uh, to improve reproductive performance. And this is just kind of a graph to lay now some of what cows do as they approach parturition. They go through the process of uh, uh, calving and, uh, and they initiate lactation, some of these challenges that the cow has to overcome to be able to reach our breeding uh, time and it has a healthy ovary and a healthy uterine environment, right? And that is what allows the cow to become pregnant again and, and, and end the lactation, reduce the risk of uh, calling, and especially because uh, if they develop uterine diseases, they, they are at increased risk for uh, removal from the farm. So as I mentioned, here I have a, a important, I think, component to be able to manage this uh, uh, transition uh, period, the weeks before calving and the weeks after calving. We do monitor this, what I call the lagging indicator. We monitor the stillbirth, the retentive membrane, nephritis, whether or not the cows stay or leave the farm, mortality for both, for cows and for calves, and milk production. Right? These are performance indicators. They tell you how we are good uh, we are doing at the farm, how cows are performing at the farm. But to be able to prevent some of these uterine diseases, especially the retained placenta and, and the dryly, uh, we, we should look at the leading risk factors, especially dry matter intake and factors that affect dry matter intake, like resting time, what cows do prior to calving, for early in lactation, cow comfort is really important, the diet and water quality, right? 
and how many days they are in the dry pen. So longer dry uh, days dry usually have a tendency that they can, get, you know, if they got too many days in the dry pen, most cows will target for about 60 days in our dry pen. Some cows spend four months in the dry pen. So they, these cows became fat and uh, 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 they stay longer in the dry pen. And then it's very difficult to manage, you know, those cows that are uh, uh, overweight and early on in lactation. So it's just a way of putting together all the risk factors and, and, and put an eye on these leading risk factors that are usually associated with many of these uh, conditions. So with that, I just give you some a few animal health uh, regulation specific for the USDA National Organic Program, and, and there is a useful information as far as uh, uh, what is allowed. And, and the list of approval uh, products, the FDA and, uh, um, and the FDA requirements, especially for those uh, uh, drugs that um, are, are, are prohibited. So with that, uh, thank you, and I'll take any questions you may have. Okay, uh, we're going to open this up for questions. I'm going to unmute mute everyone's microphone. So we're going to have a group discussion at this point. Mm -hmm. hey. Do we have any questions for Dr. Shinneman? They might be able to write a question there if they do more time. Yeah, come in. Turn okay. the light off. Yes. Then I'll go ahead and uh, re-mute the attendees' microphones. And if you'd like to submit your questions by writing, uh, we will get those to Dr. Schumann as they come in. Well, I want to thank you uh, for your time in attending this webinar. We will have this webinar recorded and archived on our website here in the next day or two. Uh, Dr. Schumann will be um, in touch with us, so if you have any questions that you would like to get to him, you can either send it to me, eric, at oeffa.org, or you can contact Dr. Schumann through the uh, College of Veterinary and Preventative Medicine there at the Ohio State University. We'll have a last call for questions. Would you like to add anything more, Dr. Shinneman? I, I, I don't, Eric. I, I don't know. Unless there is any question then regarding either uh, treatments uh, uh, or any of the information I have presented. If not, this, like you mentioned, Eric, this is going to be archived. And here is my email and phone number. Excellent. And I want to give you guys a heads up that uh, this Wednesday, Dr. Weiss from the Ohio State University will be doing another webinar on animal health. Uh, so I look forward to you registering and attending at that time. So we're going to end the webinar now. Uh, appreciate your time. Thank you.